I'm Heyman Han, Associate Editor of Lawfare, with an episode of Chatter for September 18th, 2022. In today's episode, the team at Lawfare decided to cross-post this week's episode of Chatter, a podcast hosted by David Priest and Shane Harris that features in-depth discussions with fascinating people at the creative edges of national security. Today's episode is entitled CIA Paramilitary Ops in Reality and Fiction with Rick Prado. In the episode, Preece chatted with former CIA officer Rick Prado about the fiction and the reality of CIA paramilitary operations, including stories Rick tells in his book, Black Ops, The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. They spoke about what Hollywood gets wrong about intelligence work, Rick's escape as a child from Castro's Cuba, and how he came to work for the CIA. They also talked about why his book has substantial chunks of redacted text and who he thinks played the best James Bond. This is Chatter. Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare. This week, Rick Prado on CIA paramilitary ops in reality and fiction. You know, I've been shot at, I've shot back, I've gone through all this kind of crap, but it's not something that I was doing on my own. Like when I was in the contra camps, I wasn't going out there killing Sandinistas with a knife at night because I had nothing better to do. If if this turned into a movie, that's the kind of stuff that would probably permeate. The the government doesn't know what we're doing. The the Congress doesn't know, nobody knows. This was a, everything is a rogue operation. And as, as you know, nothing could be further from the truth. My book was not written to make the agency look good. My book was written to make the agency and my colleagues be real. Rick Prado, welcome to Chatter. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. You betcha. We're going to have a real tour here because I want to talk about some CIA history, which really intertwines with your personal stories and some people that we worked with in common. But I really want to start with a theme that you write about in your book, Black Ops, and you've revisited on several other occasions, which is your your motivation for speaking out about your agency career. A lot of people write memoirs. A lot of people tell their stories in one way or another, but not too many people make it their personal mission to try to change the mindset of CIA based on crappy Hollywood movies. And that's really been your theme is I get a sense of just how pissed off you are that the agency is represented the way it is 99% of the time. So talk through that a little bit. What are some of the films that you've seen that, that really get you riled up because they they're seen by millions or tens of millions of people and they don't characterize the people that you and I worked with correctly. Actually, I think it'd be easier to say which movies don't piss me off about it. Because <laughs> we'll there's there too, yeah. The yeah. majority, literally 98%. The only one that comes to mind is Argo, um, yeah. which is a fantastic movie. Um, so the, the majority of, of these things don't don't match my... My wife hates watching TV with me because of that. Um, <laughs> I've heard it real, said that there's no worse person to watch a spy movie with than a former intelligence officer because it takes all the fun out of it. That's it. You got it. And uh, in my case, because of my paramilitary background, I also look at tactics. Uh, I'm always telling my wife, nobody would ever do that. So, uh, but, but back to the topic, though, um, it was the primary reason why I wrote the book. Actually, the only reason. I had never wanted to, to write a book in my life. Uh, as I got older and I retired for the second and third time and I had a little time for introspection, uh, I realized the incredible impact that that bad media has, not on me, my children and my grandchildren. Add to that the fact that, you know, we have 139 stars on our wall. Uh, A third of those are post 9-11. That means most of those I knew, or many of them I knew. And um, I felt insulted and I felt that um, I needed to, to do something about it. I needed to give the the, the audience a, an option of listening to something. My, my book was not written to make the agency look good. My 
book was written to make the agency and my colleagues be real, yeah. get a real aspect of, because the level of patriotism that my peers always have had, uh, it, it's, uh, you know. Yeah. I'll take you back to, to a few movies that I've seen that really got me upset. So going, going back a few years now, the three days of the condor, um, of course, a fun movie in some ways, but it, it started a theme that I've said here before I hate, which is so many movies about the CIA involve either a person or more often a, an entire work unit that is evil and goes rogue and is doing something that is blatantly illegal and unethical. And it's shown to represent the true agency ethos. And that that has bothered me from when I first saw that movie and carried through so many modern movies that yes, there can be bad eggs in every organization. They're going to be there, right? We've worked with some of them, but the idea that the senior leadership is that inherently evil or that an entire rogue operation can gain momentum through all of these people working in tandem in a conspiracy. Uh, it's just, it's just maddening to see that trope over and over again. Yeah. It, it is a, the current theme through, through all of them. Um, and, and uh, the Three Days of the Condor is, is a very good example. But if you look at it, fast forward to the Jason Bourne series, you have exactly the same thing. Only in this case, it's a maniacal assassin that uh, was, on, you know, blah, 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 blah. And now they're trying to kill him because they want to keep the secrets. Uh, it, it is just a worn out record. Um, and that's the only one they play. Yeah. And there's a there's an angle there, too, which is the assassin's story. So. Yes, there, there have been people employed by the Central Intelligence Agency who, in modern times with a presidential finding or during a time of war, um, have engaged in acts that killed people. Got it, right? That, that's, that's part of the job of the, the nation's defense. But in, in books and movies, often it's the typical CIA officer is trained as an assassin or CIA officers regularly engage in off the books assassinations around the world. And that creates a very, very different image of the work overseas of the average operations officer, doesn't it? It, it certainly does. And, and, you know, it, it's uh, another very current theme with it. It is that the, the government doesn't know what we're doing. The, the Congress doesn't know. Nobody knows. This was a, everything is a rogue operation. And as, as you know, nothing could be further from the truth. That's one of the things that I try to also inculcate in the book is the amount of oversight, I don't mind any of it, that we have from all our, our, all our branches, including the FBI, the things that we cannot do in the United States or what we have to do right. to help them in the United States is all very well documented and, and um, you know, approved. In fact, there are some movies, I'm thinking here of the Mission Impossible franchise that, that has made that their whole shtick that not only is it not approved it's basically go do what you have to do and if anything goes south uh we will disavow any knowledge of this so any knowledge of your activities yeah. Yeah. right so it's one. really the opposite of reality isn't it it really is it yeah really is. well for me the ones that get me are you know, you, you do everything you can in, in intensive training and in earlier assignments to make sure that you're never on the X, that you're never, I think what you call it is, you know, going red on the spectrum. Um, and if you do, your goal is to get out of there alive. Um, your goal is not to engage in a, you know, extended high speed car chase. Um, it's simply to, to get out and to get safe as quickly as possible, whether to an embassy uh, U.S. or other friendly embassy. Um, sometimes a five-star hotel is great because you know they have security and surveillance. But the whole point is to get away from the conflict, not to engage in a conflict like we've seen in some movies with spectacular firefights and gun and car chases and sometimes both. And yet, you know, my experience certainly was never like true lies where suddenly there's, you know, you're, you're, you're having airplanes shoot at each other or you're having major munitions blow up. Um, seems to me that in those cases, everybody who watches them gets enjoyment out of them. But you're actually not telling the true fun stories of spy tradecraft. 
Well, you know, um, True Lies is, is actually a fun movie to watch because it's meant to be a fantasy. You know, for example, I love James Bond movies. Yeah. They're not real. I don't expect them to be real. They're not shown to be real. I mean, if it was, I'd, you know, I'm still waiting for my Austin Martin, right? So it, it, is, it is all that fa- when it's fantasy. The, the problem is movies like Jason Bourne and, and The Three Days of the Condor and many others try to make it. That's what's real. It's, it's not tongue in cheek. It's, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger played a fantastic role in that movie and you laughed through half the movie. It's not to be a, an action movie. It's a funny movie. And there's a difference. Yes. Yeah, it's funny that the James Bond movies, especially with Roger Moore and I think Sean Connery, they did a good job of basically winking at the audience and saying, you know, we're making fun of spy movies, right? <laughs> it became a, a genre of that. And, but then, of course, the more modern ones have lost a little bit of that that talking to the audience element and just have become action thrillers in and of themselves. Yeah. But you know, the, I think the difference in with, with those kind of movies is, and I think the Brits did a fantastic psyops from, from supporting this from day one is that you don't see that theme of James Bond doing something that, you know, M doesn't know about. If you get my drift, it is all sanctioned. It's, he's, it's go do whatever you need to do, but this is what you need to do. Absolutely. So uh, I think that that's that's the, the one little difference there with that and the other with the other movies. The Hollywood excuse is typically, well, we need to make something entertaining. We need to make something that audiences will engage with. And you already highlighted Argo, which is a fantastic story, a fantastic film with a few issues because it really does stick to the story, at least as Tony Mendez usually told it. Um, I didn't like the airport scene at the end, but overall, I think it, it did a very good job. And it showed that there are, and it's not the only one, um, you've lived through some of them. There are some remarkable stories of what's happened in the service of the country as an intelligence officer that, that can be both true and remarkably entertaining. Well, you know, and, and that was, again, I think one of the things that has helped my book tremendously, because that was the, the second purpose was, you know, in saying what the agency really does, and what the ethos of my colleagues really is, I have given examples about what it is that we do, and, and, and it's sexy, and it's dangerous, and, you know, I've been shot at, I've shot back, I've done through all this kind of crap, but it's not, you know, uh, something that I was doing on my own, like when I was in the contract camps, I wasn't, you know, going out there killing Sandinistas with a knife at night, because I had nothing better to do. If, they, if this turned into a movie, that's the kind of stuff that would probably permeate it. You know? That's a good point. And, and that you referenced the paramilitary side and so many people who have written about their experiences at the agency uh, come from the traditional case officer side um, and then moving into management or they are former directors or deputy directors, some of whom were not career intelligence officers and then some from the analytics side. But very, very few examples of people who worked in the special activities division for most of their career uh, coming out and telling these stories. So let's establish that first. The um, SAD, and it was never pronounced as SAD, um, unlike many acronyms that become the word they look like. It was always SAD, SAD. until changed to SAC uh, in recent yeah. years. But um, after after we'd left, it was SAD back then. Um, but But you had a different road getting there than a whole lot of other paramilitary officers. So can you describe your... Um, when you grew up your first several years in Cuba and the program that bought you, brought you to the United States and, and set you on the road to both American citizenship and eventually working at CIA. Yeah. i um, Cuban born. Uh, I was uh, seven or eight years old when the revolution was ra- raging. Um, especially in my small town, we lived in a medium sized town in the foothills of the mountains where Che Guevara and a lot of his, uh, uh freedom fighters were, were involved in there. So my town was always one that they come in and do raids and do, you know, harassment kind of, uh, so I literally, you know, witnessed my first firefight when I was seven or eight, standing two feet away from somebody that I didn't see that was below my window that came up and started shooting automatic weapon and literally two feet in front of me. Um, people being shot, uh, the damage being done, the, the, what you see next door, and, and that obviously uh, has an effect on you. I can, re, you know, I can relive those those moments by just closing my eyes for a second. But 
that was the beginning of, I believe, God forging what I was to become. Um, I, I believe that um, if you uh, if you accept the path and you're willing to pay the price of admission, you'll you'll live a good life. And I believe that because I, I could I pinch myself to this day. So, but what really made it even stronger was how quickly I saw what communism did to Cuba, what it did to my family, what it did to my friends, uh, the separations of the families, the castration of the church, kicking out the priest. It was just, it was a complete overture in, in, in less than six months. So that, that, that reality that I lived through uh, watching, you know, um, when the first time that I went to Havana before leaving, you know, I've been to Havana before, but this is the first time we went there to move there to try to get out of Cuba. As soon as we came down the main avenue there, there was three guys hanging from a tree with signs that said, we are counter-revolutionaries. Uh, and of course, now I am nine years old. Um, that's tattooed in my brain also. Well, the, that's the, a good the, point. You know, if you're, if you're a couple of years old when that happens, you, you'll hear stories about this from your family later on that will create memories. But you're old enough at this point that, that these are memories. These are etched into you in a way that you can never forget. Absolutely. And my father was amazed. Uh, he lived with us for the last five years of his life. And uh, he says, how can you remember that? I said, Dad, these were not normal times. I don't remember playing in the playground. I remember I had a horse, but I don't remember riding the darn thing. But I remember clearly, you know, all these episodes, including uh, obviously the, the probably the most painful thing that my parents ever been through uh, was putting me on an airplane to come to this wonderful country yeah. by myself because they could at that time not get out. And we did that through this uh, program called Pedro Pan, Peter Pan, um, which I believe is 14,000 kids yeah. that were, uh, uh, you know, uh, brought out to the United States. And I was 10 years old when I got on that airplane. Um, and you talk about memories. I remember going through the glass doors where my parents had to stay behind. They, they call it the fishbowl, actually. And seeing my mom just absolutely hysterical and my dad biting his lip. Uh, and I remember that's crystal clear. I remember getting into the airport. After that moment that I cleared that, you know, the, the, the last uh, checkpoint there, I have no recollection of anything until I landed in Miami. Hmm. So I must have been in shock. It's, it's just, you know, it, it is, you know, a 10 year old going into a, an unknown adventure. I don't remember where I sat on the plane. I don't remember getting into the plane. I don't remember getting out of the plane. Yeah. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a mixed ball, but the important things are very, very clear in my brain. Yes. And that program is is so remarkable. And it's it's sad to me that so many, I didn't learn about it in, in school or growing up, I read about it much later that this clandestine program, at least originally, to get to get so many children out, originally people who were being targeted as, you know, parts of um, families that supported Batista, but then later many others. Um, and it included so many people, including the, the stepfather of Jeff Bezos, uh, U.S. Senator Mel Martinez was part of uh, this program. Um, but then you get to the United States and often you, you don't have extended family in the United States. So in some cases, people are put, uh, children are put into some camps. Uh, in your case, you were actually sent to Colorado. How did that happen? Yeah, um, the, there were three camps in South Florida, Florida City, Opalaca, and um, Matacumbe were the three camps. And I ended up in Florida City. I was there for maybe two weeks at the most. But they were also, I mean, these camps were growing at a speed that they could not be maintained. So there were some adoptive parents, you know, foster homes kind of things. Um, I drew, you know, I don't know if you call it the, the short stick or the long stick, but I ended up in Pueblo, Colorado, which has always been a, a blue collar town. You could imagine back in, in uh, 1962. And I turned 11 at, at that orphanage. And there are two ways you can really go from an experience like that. One is you can have a lifelong hatred of the mountains and anxiety about a setting like that because of that separation, uh, or you can come to really appreciate it. And it sounds like the latter happened for you, that you've learned to enjoy 
the the variety of life experiences traveling all over you you actually relish that in a way that you turned something that could have gone very negative into a positive you know it's uh it, it, that's the beauty of it when when you're going through any of these trials and tribulations they're extremely painful they're they're heartbreaking but when you come out the other end uh, there's a couple of things that take effect first of all now you believe that you can survive things little by little by little yeah. you start believing and re recognize that you could you could handle a lot more than what you thought was possible mm -hmm. uh, so for me and, and and thank you for bringing that out about, about in the book is that i took the opportunity in the book to those alma maters of mine peter pan pararescue uh, because they were part of that forging of me um Pararescue is 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 what I went into when when I wanted to try to serve. Right. And Air Force Pararescue, as you know, is part of our special operations community. Uh, the, the the attrition rate is the same as SEALs and Green Berets is 80 percent. Um, so we go through that gamut. And, you know, I thought I was pretty fit and I thought I was pretty tough when I went into Pararescue. I puked for the first week that I was there. So mm -hmm. um, but I made it. So I think that, that, that it is that the orphanage had that same kind of uh, experience. Yes, it was rough. Yes, there were a lot of fights. Yes, there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of discipline because you had four or five different cultures and languages uh, mixed in uh, a batch of kids that are actually angry at the world because mm -hmm. they don't have a parent. So uh, I had the advantage, though, uh, over any of my peers there at the, at the orphanage is that my dad was my first hero. And uh, he grabbed me and he told me before I got on the plane, he says, I will see you again. So that was like my security blanket for all the time that I was there when I had a bad moment. And let me tell you, I mean, I, at night I could hear other kids crying. I could hear other kids crying in their beds. And when I started feeling a little uncertain, I always remember my dad's words and he was right. And that obviously drove you to do some things to push yourself to the edge. You already mentioned going into Air Force and pararescue. Um, but using that experience, you ended up applying, if I recall correctly, to the Secret Service as well as to the CIA. Talk about the Secret Service one for me, because this is a time when the Secret Service was not the massive organization that it is now. It was not small by any means, it, but it was much smaller and I'm wondering what experience you had or, or what mentor you had. Why did you apply to the Secret Service and how did you envision a potential career there? You know, um, first of all, pararescue. Uh, let me go back a step. I didn't know the difference between Army, Navy, Air Force or Marines. You know, I, I had been in this country for eight years. I still had an accent and nobody in my family ever wore even a Boy Scout uniform. So I had never a role model of my grandfather fighting in some war or something that I that that was romanticized for me. Uh, I was in junior college when I met a, a friend, a guy. We were in the same class, oceanography class, Glenn Richardson, and he's the one that pitched me on pararescue. And for me, that was, you know, because I have a lot of people as I still train our special off, uh, forces. Uh, they say, well, why did you become a PJ? I said, that's all I knew. That was what first came through my door. And then, of course, I fell in love with it. And I'm very proud of it. But so that association and um, it was like in 1974 was the first time that I tried to apply out of. Uh, I, I was now in full uh, reserves uh, at, uh, with a 301st pararescue. And uh, I applied to the agency and they came back with a really nice note that said, uh, we're firing, not hiring. Uh, that was basically it. This is the Bad post-Vietnam years where they were, you know, the attrition for our special military and for us was incredible. Um, later on, around 79, and I went to, to a ride rescue with the Miami Metro uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a rescue special because I was already an EMT too. And I applied again, and I think it was like 1979, I applied again to the agency and I applied to the Secret Service. Again, I had done, you know, back then we didn't have Google searches, right? So just go to the library, try to figure out, you know, you know, they, uh, what kind of thing floated my boat. I had never met a Secret Service guy. But looking at their mission and looking at the amount of training that, that they seemed to do, I thought that was, a, that was an option. Uh, funny, they did call me. They called me. They said I tested really well, but the agency had 
called me first. Uh -huh. and, and so I got that on the books. Yeah. Now, over the course of your career, you did get the opportunity to work with Secret Service agents in particular cases. Not not everybody in the CIA is constantly working with the Secret Service, but I, I had the opportunity to work with some on a few occasions in CTC and afterwards, but you also did. Did you did that did that cause some interesting reflections for you to think back and talk about the, the road not taken and how you could have been in their shoes at all? No, and I was glad I wasn't because I, I've, I've made some really good friends of the Secret Service and many of them wanted to come over to the agency. Sure. And some have. Because, yeah. Because, you know, for them, yeah, you know, they're action guys and, you know, kind of like our business, our business is not action. Our business is getting away with deeds or yeah. collecting intelligence. Of course, yeah. I'm talking about black ops, covert ops. And the problem with the Secret Service is same as ours. The, the second you draw your weapon, mm -hmm. your mission is compromised. Yeah. You, I mean, that's it. You may survive. You may save the principal. You may be able to do all this stuff, but you still allowed somebody to sneak up on you one way or the other. So uh, I never regretted it. You know, you mentioned CTC and, and our counterterrorist center was the creation of that hub. We had federal representation mm -hmm. from every agency, including diplomatic security, yeah. ATF. Uh, they were all present there. And that was a great melting pot for us. So you got into the, the CIA and from the beginning you were doing paramilitary work. Uh, but fascinating, it was not a typical paramilitary track. That is, you were not brought in, given the training, uh, given an assignment, go out for a tour. You were almost immediately thrown down to work with the Contras um, in Honduras, right? Across the northern border from Nicaragua, where the Sandistas had had taken over and there was the, the burgeoning resistance movement um, there at the time. Um, you were really thrown out, not completely alone, but very much more alone than most officers are in a traditional career. Um, in that experience, did you find that you, you felt like you had greater freedom of action than the colleagues that you later talked to and they went through a more traditional experience and did they experience, did they, did they show any jealousy of your experiences and wish that they would have had that freedom to operate that you initially did? Very astute question. And, and the answer is yes. Um, even the guys that came to the Contra program after I did, uh, were now in groups of four or five guys and, you know, they had their own little huts and they had food come in and all that other stuff. Um, I, what happened for me was at the time I was working contract with the agency. I first, my toehold was through contract field because I was a paramedic and a pararescueman and they needed that kind of skills for trainees and missions. And uh, when I saw that that wasn't take, getting me anywhere, I, I couldn't afford to lose my seniority in the fire department. So I went back to uh, Metro Rescue and Reagan comes in, decides to start weeding our, bad, uh, our backyard uh, from all these communist uh, insurgencies that were popping up everywhere. And the agency, as it was told to me by uh, the guy that recruited me, Dave, um, that we didn't have a native Spanish speaking guy with paramilitary skills. Amazing. And they were literally going around going, what was the name of that Cuban kid, the PJ, you know? And, <laughs> and of course, Dave says, that's Rick Prado. And um, so the rest is history. So, I got to Honduras two weeks after that phone call. Mm. At the phone call on a Thursday, I was in the building Monday morning, going through further polygraphs, mm -hmm. going through all the kind of briefings, medical, alias docs, uh, uh, but no training whatsoever. I received zero training. The only thing that I got was some, hey, this is what's going on kind of briefings from our DI. Mm -hmm. um, but I did not go through a single course. So I landed in Honduras uh, with two weeks under my belt and um, pretty much uh, part of a uh, five person team, whereas I was the only person allowed to go to the camps because I could pull off the hidden hand. Again, black ops means that you're mm -hmm. supposed to be able to deny your presence there. And as a Latino who spoke native Spanish, um, I didn't raise an eyebrow and the Hondurans were extremely gracious about 
coaching me and giving me the right documentation. I was there as a, as an Air Force intelligence major. You made an important point there, Rick, about the the black ops portion of this. So when people think about, and, and I think this is true across the, the American imagination overall, is there's national security is the largest circle. And that's a whole bunch of people working in a whole bunch of different ways. And then you narrow in, eventually you get down to something that they might describe as special forces or, you know, direct action or paramilitary. But there's a real distinction there between the units within the U.S. military services who do some similar tactics and and those in the Central Intelligence Agency, primarily because the latter and the, the career you chose, you're involved in covert action. Um, whereas the U.S. military deploying somewhere, even if they are special forces, often that is an overt action and the, the purposes are slightly different. Now, at the time you started, you had not gone through the farm to do the full ops training and everything of that. But eventually you did because they realized what a real asset to be working on the ground with all of these people and to have that training to spot and assess and develop and recruit along with the paramilitary mission is a really strong one. Did you find yourself merging those two missions in your job? That is focusing on the paramilitary mission at its core, but also starting to appreciate, in a sense, the spy tradecraft of it all. Yeah, you know, I, I, the problem with the agency for recruiting is that we know so little about it, except going back to the dead horse, the the bad media that it gets. Sure, it always uh, does. And there, there weren't, you know, back when, when I was looking at this, there weren't even any books written by anybody that portrayed or, or talked about what the agency was. So to me, it was, you know, ignorance is bliss. I had no idea of what the agency really did other than, you know, we're action oriented and we are, we, we're, we're told to kick ass. So when I started my paramilitary side there in, in, in the Honduran Nicaraguan border, where I lived for a little over three years, um, it, it, my coaching came from my boss, uh, Colonel Ray, very early on started teaching me about, hey, these are the goals. This is, we are, we're an intelligence agency. We are main, we only have, really, we only have operationally, we only have two, two missions. One is steel intelligence, one way or another, and covert action at the behest of, of the president. And you're spot on. I mean, I, I work a lot with, uh, for seven years, I taught at Fort Bragg, uh, Advanced Special Operations and Techniques. And I, I dealt with all the, all the soft guys there. And there wasn't a class where there was two or three guys that wanted to come over and say, man, how do I get into Ground Branch? How do I get into SAD? <laughs> and I always tell them, I said, be careful, because the other man's grass may be greener because he's got more bullshit on it. Yeah. Um, don't, don't, don't give up one for the other. But it is different because we do what's called low visibility operations. Yeah. We are not in uniform, with the exception of like when I was in Honduras, of course I was. But, you know, in, in 99% of our operations, we are trying to fly under the radar. We are trying to not call any attention to ourselves. And you have to learn to blend in mm -hmm. socially, culturally, linguistically, uh, and so on. So I think that, you know, Green Berets are the ones that come the closest because they do have the language requirements, uh, although they're not nowhere as strict as, uh, as, as ours are in the agency. But, but those were all part of the grooming part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I, you know, when, by the time that I left uh, Honduras uh, three uh, and a third year later, uh, I had a, a good idea of what was I getting myself into. And that what I had been doing for the last three years was actually the exception, not the rule. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to understand that that program was not only the first covert action program successful for the agency in decades. Yeah. Um, but it was the one that actually resuscitated the agency's ability to recruit and grow and everything else because the resources were there and the missions were there and, and it was the turning on of that spigot. Right. So um, then, you know, I went straight from there to finish my college and, and went into uh, into the, the farm, as they call it. And that was, I love reinventing myself. I love growth. I, I still do, even at my age. Um for me now, it was, okay, I've been a blunt instrument for the last three years. Yeah. Now I got to polish up 
And luckily, you know, I worked in a, in a men's, men's clothes in, in, in high school, so I kind of knew how to dress up and clean up. But one thing is, you know, a suit. The other thing is acting like you belong in the suit. Mm-hmm. So um, in, in the, in the farm does a very good job of, of, yeah. of molding that also. They, 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 they have a lot of good tutorials. You have your instructors are incredible. So uh, when, I, when I left the farm, I was very, very ready to uh, go tackle whatever, whatever was thrown at me. It was, yeah. You know, you mentioned um, the work with the Contras, and I, and I want to talk just a little bit about that because few people have had more hands-on experience, you know, both on the, the northern and the southern borders and across several years as the, as the conflict uh, exploded and expanded. There's, there's an occupational risk to intelligence work in the field, whether you're a core collector and you become the chief of station and you're there for, for years, or whether you're paramilitary and, and embedded with, with some of the locals, um, which is clientitis, right? You can end up seeing things only one way. And, and part of that's good because that means you've bought into the mission, you're doing 100% to get that mission accomplished. Um, that can put blinders on you. Uh, one of the things I like about when, when you discuss the contrast is you really look at both sides and you are brutally honest on, on both sides of this. On the one hand, pointing out that yes, there were elements, uh, especially some particular leadership that took over a small group you once worked with who degenerated into banditry and all discipline broke down. They were raiding ranches. They were stealing from the populace in a way that the Sandinistas had done that was systematic, but there were elements doing it within the Contras, um, even involving rape and, and murder. Um, and you call that out when you see it. And, and you said, yeah, that's that that's not what the, that's not what we were fighting with and what we were fighting for. But of course, you call out what the Sandinistas were doing in Nicaragua and the fact that so many of the people going into the Contras movement were were literally trying to save their lives, to save their way of life, and that the the excesses of those small groups were not reflective of the overall movement. And I'm wondering if you can talk through that a little bit, because again, in the American cultural memory of this, I think it, it has somewhat shifted over time where, where people take the cases they know best, which often are those excesses on the extremes, and they project that onto the entire movement, whereas you present a, a better form of balance than I've seen from many people who worked with them. So share a little bit about that and how it is that you can hold both views in your head at the same time, that there were people there who did some extremely horrible things, and yet overall as a movement, these were people fighting the just cause. Yes, you know, I, I had the benefit of um, being a little bit street savvy, uh, and I had the benefit of understanding what these people were going through, because here I am now at age 30, fighting the very same monster that destroyed my first country and my family. So for me, that that was, I had no rose-colored glasses about anybody. I knew uh but, but I'll give you an example. The, you mentioned the atrocities that were committed. And as you know from the book, I personally brought those bad guys back to justice. I went down there on my own uh, with, un, under orders. It was not Jason Bourne on my own kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I brought those guys back and, and, and they were tried and, and convicted. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were tried and convicted. When, when the FDN found out what was going out there, they came to us and go, we don't know what to do. And yeah. they say, said, Alex, that was my name. I was Major <laughs> Alex. And Alex, yeah. I went down there and I brought the guys back. And that, that camp became, again, a uh, textbook camp of what we were supposed to have. So there were, there were corrective actions. And, you know, I'm not saying that there wasn't illegalities going on and there was theft of stuff going on. But, you know, that happens even in the U.S. military. That happens in any military, in any organization. So these cases that you highlighted were actually the exception, not the rule. For me, the most rewarding thing was, David, every single night after I did all my days of training at the camp, I would sit down in a different fire uh, place with different countries, and I would always ask them, why are you here? And believe it or not, not a single one of them said, well, you know, I read Marx and Lenin, and I don't agree with that philosophy. <laughs> Someone didn't even know who Castro was, right? you know, but they all had a personal reason for being there. My daughter was raped. Yeah. 
they burned down my church, those kind of examples. Yeah. And that, that was very purifying to me. I mean, that was such a noble, pure uh, mentality of people that are living in sub poverty, uh, you know, in lean to tents and, and kind of stuff like that with jungle rot. Mm-hmm. Um, Have you seen any fictional representations um, in film or books that actually capture that spirit accurately? No, I can't. I can't say that I have. Um, obviously, you know, Vietnam. Although I didn't get to go there, I have a lot of very good friends that spent a lot of time there. Um, they have a, a, the same affinity, you know, the hate for the communist Vietnamese, but the love for these guys that are fighting, you know, tooth and nail to 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 save their country from that uh, that that cancer. And um, it, but I think it's the other way around. Usually, it's uh, we're we're portrayed as being equally. Um, malevolent as the, the enemy that we have. Right. Right. Well, you did a number of other jobs at, at CIA over the years, but I want to cut forward to when you made it to the uh, Counterterrorist Center or CTC, which we referenced earlier. You were truly there at the creation of something which was little known at the time, but decades later has has gathered this mythology around it. And that is Alec Station. Can you describe Alec Station and your role in it and why it was so special? Well, I was, uh, it was a station. Uh, it was called an issue station. It was a new creation. The idea was to have a, a particular topic that we wanted to attack worldwide and place it just outside of headquarters. We were not in headquarters. We were literally outside headquarters. Had release authority. We could send cables out to anywhere in the world. Uh, and ask them to look into this and look into that. So that that was the virtual virtual station concept. And I was the deputy chief of station, mm-hmm. and I was also the senior operations officer because the chief of station was Mike Scheuer, who was a senior analyst. I was a GS-15 when I was doing this. So uh, I got called in by by the uh, chief of operations at that time, and he, he said to me, he says, um, your name has been raised to be deputy chief of station on this special thing. I'm going like, Okay, I was a branch chief, for God's sake. And uh, he says, I, I said, well, chief, what, what, who's the target? And he says, Osama bin Laden. And I said, who? <laughs> and he says, exactly. Because this is what, 1995, I think? Uh, late 1995. Yeah. We, uh, we kicked it into full action in early 96. Yeah. And I believe there was only eight or nine of us that are the original plank holders. Mm-hmm. Although we consider some that came right after plank holders, you know, uh, you know, uh, Jennifer mm-hmm. Matthews, for example, one that uh, that that came right. in very, very early on, and it was a very long, long track with that. So I did I did a little over a year uh, or about a year at the Alex Station as the chief as the deputy chief of station, uh, where is where I got to work at least through cables uh, with uh, Billy Waugh, mm-hmm. who was uh, at the time the guy doing surveillance on Bin Laden in Khartoum. Um, so it was a it was a very fast growth. We went from having one folder on Bin Laden, and and by and within six months we had a full wall, mm-hmm. full of folders and folders and folders from the, all the different sourcings that we were able to tap into. Mm-hmm. You know the the beauty of that unit, and 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 of course I'm extremely proud of being a plank owner of that, is that that is the same unit that eventually identified and and, and was able to do the deed to uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, and it was the one that subsequently have caught other big wheels, um, you know, that had taken over. And, and that's, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, SEAL teams got, got Bin Laden. I said, no. First of all, SEAL teams were ter- working under our Title 50 authorities, which they don't have. Mm-hmm. They're literally, the way that it works is they are detailed to the agency for the legalities, which is the Title 50. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were literally CIA seals when they, when they shot the line in the face. So yeah, I'd like to point that one out. <laughs> so the Alex station experience, uh, eventually got you back to the CTC front office. And I remember spending a lot of time in the CTC front office in 2001, uh, before September 11th, when I had moved to CTC, um, talking to 
one of my former, I say colleagues, because he was always a colleague to everyone, despite the fact that he was far senior to me at the time. Um, but he was the deputy chief of the counterterrorism center. And this is uh, Benny Bonk, um, who was working with, I think Kofor Black was chief of CTC at the time, and, and Ben was, was deputy. Um, Kofor and Hank Crumpton um, has written a book, and Jose Rodriguez, who succeeded as, as chief of CTC, has written a book. So I think those names are known to a, a wide range of people who follow national security widely, and particularly agency operations. But Ben Bonk is a bit of an unsung hero there. Talk a little bit about how you got to know Ben and and how you found his place among the people you worked with. Well, I'll, I'll start by caveating the reality that I'm going to be very prejudiced because I was a very good friend of Ben Bonk. Uh, we had never met before. We met when I came to CTC as uh, chief of international terrorism and then moved up to be chief of uh, operations. And we had personal commonalities. He was a big Formula One racing fan, and we literally uh, went to the U.S. uh, Formula One together. Mm. But he was two things above everything else. He was arguably the smartest man I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, he was by far the nicest man I've ever met in my life. And you were in our building to know that, you know, we, we are, we suffer the same, you know, picadillos of jealousies and everything else. And people talk crap about people. In all my years, I have never heard the name of Ben Bonk that did not come with accolades. Mm-hmm. Um, he was also a big stabilizing force for Kofor because I love Kofor to death. I mean, he's one of my, my biggest mentors. I stay in touch with him and talk at least once a month. Um, but Kofor has the pit bull, give me a rag under my nose. I'm going to go get that rabbit where Ben was the guy that could actually soften some of the things. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, he was the only guy that could handle him there. Yeah. I, I replaced Hank Crumpton as chief of ops uh, in May of, of 2001, and he went to uh, Canberra. Yeah. Uh, but we brought him back to, again, join the fold after 9-11, because he's the one that uh, yeah. ran uh, SO, which was the actual war into Afghanistan scenarios. But I, I have, uh, I, 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 there isn't a, a week that I don't think of Ben. He's still in my prayers. Yeah. Um, I watch Formula One still <laughs> with passion, and he's always there. Yeah. That's Great a, guy. And I'm glad he's getting some recognition. And, and he should. He tragically uh, was taken from us far too early by a horrible cancer. And, and I think that's part of it is, is people have not been able to get his, his stories directly for so many years now uh, because of that. But that also means, of course, that you were uh, in the CTC front office on September 11th itself. Uh, walk through that morning. What was your experience on September 11th as the attacks happened? Well, as, as, as you know from being there, you know, the, uh, the front office in CTC actually has four positions. You know, you have Kofor Black, who at the time was the director. Uh, ben Bonk, who was a senior analyst, was his deputy. Uh, and then he had two other deputies me for ops and um, one for the FBI for law enforcement. And uh, that, that was, that was kind of like the front office until the 911 and we brought Hank back in. So I was literally in front of uh, Kofor's office waiting to go talk to Kofor about something. And I was talking to his secretary and Libby and you know, they have a huge TV there on, on, on in, the, in the lobby. And all of a sudden you see that first aircraft hit, hit the towers I, for one, and everybody that was looking at it, we said, oh, my God, that, 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 was that a Cessna? Was that a, you know, a Falcon? Well, what was it? You know, it, it didn't look that ominous uh, on the first clippings when you have people from a distance, you know, cameras got capturing this. Um, shortly thereafter, um, the, like I told you, we had a lot of federal presence. We had an ATF representative there, and he came up to me immediately. He goes, hey, chief. We got a problem. I said, what's that? He says, we got four aircraft that activated their... This was the FAA rep, right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. He was the FAA guy. The last name was White. And uh, he he came in and he told me, he says, Leo, we have four aircraft that have declared emergencies. None of them are responding to our communications. So uh, 15 seconds later, here comes a second airplane and, and hits the tower again. 
And I remember that the first action that I took was um, Kofor's chief of staff happened to be almost next to me when we were watching the second plane go in. And I told him, I said, I want to cable out to the whole overseas community of ours. Watch your six. This is not a single bin, you know, this is not a singleton operation. And second, you need to dedicate every resource you can to try to help us figure out who, what, and what, where, and, and, and how. Uh, that, that, was the, that was the beginning of uh, a very crazy period. Um, the, the craziest three days, I literally slept in my office. So did most of my, my, my colleagues. Uh, I literally, luckily, I always kept an extra side, sense of clothes in there. But I would go to the gym and, and shower and come back up and, and, and work. And one, one of the, the, uh, the, the, the vignettes that I always like to highlight, because I, I think it, 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 you know, it typifies what the ethos of our folks are. The very first night, it was around seven or eight o'clock at night, I finally go moving back to my office because my office was opposite Colfer's in the corner. And I'm, as I'm walking in, the deputy chief of the Hezbollah branch, Christy, was glued to the computer doing this kind of stuff, typing away and reading away. But she was eight months pregnant. And I walked up to her and I said, Christy, what the hell are you doing here? As you know, the building was evacuated. Only CTC was, that's right. you know, remained in there. And um, Christy told me, says, she points her finger at me. And she goes, boss, remember that before this, Nobody had killed more Americans than Hezbollah. And I'm not sure that their hand, we need to know if their hand is in it. And I said, well, uh, I tell you what, I've delivered two kids in my life. None of them were mine. Uh, I'm not delivering a third. And I forced her to go home. <laughs> and the reason I like telling that story is because later on, when I saw her several years later again, she tells me, says, you know, Rick, every time my daughter has a birthday, I think of you. And how is that important in highlighting our, our careers, if you can override the maternal instinct of an eight-month-old pregnant woman mm -hmm. for trying to n finish your mission, yeah, I believe that of all the stories that I tell, that to me is the one that typifies our ethos the most. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a, a different angle on that story, uh, not her directly, but, but others just like her. So I was on a TDY that uh, you sent, not you personally sent me on, but the front office sent me on um, that started just before September 11th. And it was, it was a long one with, with, with several, several stops on something un, unrelated, but for CTC and I'm traveling. And of course I'm, I'm aware of what happened on 9-11 like everyone else. Um, but I was, I was not at a level where they were going to fly a special uh, military cleared plane to bring me back. One of my colleagues was, he, he was one of the few people who was a bin Laden expert at the time. And, and he was brought back quickly to Washington. Um, but I had a few days and then airspace opened up and I got back and I immediately go into work. And what did I find? Um, I found some people whom I recognized, you know, I could tell who they were but they looked like the zombie version of their former self because in some cases they had been home perhaps only once in four days to get a fresh duffel bag full of clothes and then turn right back around. They literally slept at their desk or uh, you remember there were cots brought in. Yes. Uh, they brought, they brought in cots. Among others. Um, Support. They brought in, of course, I had an air mattress, but that's a different story. You, you were living in the lap of luxury to make up for your Honduras days, right? And there were people who were literally collapsing. Um, and, and I was basically the second shift. I came in relatively fresh um, off the plane and basically said to people in my work unit, go home. You know, I will call the Spose to drag you out of here if need be, because you've done Herculean efforts. It's my turn to be tired now. Um, so I saw the tail end of what you're talking about, which is the people who refused to leave the people who said, we can't believe this happened. It is not going to happen again. And we will do everything, including exhausting ourselves to make sure that we, we leave no stone unturned for what we expected was the next wave of attacks. You know, it, it's, uh, it's amazing because the majority of the people in CTC at the time, and, and as you know, CTC, 
doubled, if not tripled, uh, after 9-11, but it was already a sizable entity, uh, is, is, the, is the number of people that really rode themselves into the ground. I mean, they, they, were, they were working these incredible hours and uh, never batting an eye, never, never complaining. Um, it, it was amazing because I, I, had, I remember one talk, uh, one pep talk that, that Kofor gave us. He said, um, I know we're all getting edgy. He, he held a, a, a big uh, event there in one of the, the big rooms and said, uh, you know, we're all getting edgy. We're all getting irritated. He says, I want you to do this. And this is why I love Kofor. He's, he's not a manager. He's a leader. You know, he turned to everybody and says, I want you to look to the person on your left, the person on your right, the person in front of you, and the person in back. And everybody does as he's told. He says, now remember that one of those may not be here at the end of this fight. So be nice. That's a hell of a message. Wow. You know, in reading your, your stories, as you wrote in your, your book, I noticed that, especially in this part of the narrative, when it gets to some of your experiences helping to run North Korean ops, but especially on the counterterrorism ops, there are a dramatic number of redactions. And all of us formers who have written books about intelligence have stories about working with the publication review board. Um, some people choose to, you know, revise the language or just not tell the story at all. In your case, you chose to tell the story. And in some cases, there's a whole paragraph or a whole page, the core of the story that is blacked out. Um, why did you choose to keep that in there to, to show what was there, even when the core of the story now couldn't be told? There was a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, and the publisher agreed, there is sexy, something sexy about blacked out stuff. People really, really want to try to figure out what it is. Did you ever just black out like the word orange or apple for that effect? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, actually, it's funny. One, one of the things that they, they so consistently, because I've seen it in several books, that they, uh, that they wipe out is the, the Browning High Power, which was our sidearm yeah. until we went to the Glock in the early 90s. Yeah. Uh, but I got blacked out of mine. They, you know, the fact that I carry one on Honduras, they black. So because it's on the books, you can't say that. I believe this because during the Vietnam era, our agency guys were seen with a Browning. And the joke was, if you're wearing a brown, if you're carrying a Browning, okay. you're, you're agency. But hmm. um, it's, it's that kind of uh, mentality. But anyway, the, the real reason was, first of all, I wrote it in a way that, yes, you know, there's something missing but you know what the outcome is or what it's where it's going or where it didn't or wasn't allowed to go. Cause that's a big part of the book of where the things that we were not allowed to, to, to go do. Um, and I, I have found that a lot of the people that are pretty smart or worldly have figured out some of the things that, you know, like Shangri-La and that Latin American country and what was going on here. The bulk of the scratch outs, though, were on uh, on the last project that I that I worked on. Mm -hmm. They allowed me to uh, talk about the concept of the project, yeah. uh, the goals of the project, uh, my, briefing the vice president of the United States and Condoleezza Rice on the project, mm -hmm. uh, them giving us the green light um, and us going out there and actually doing sleuth hound work, trying to track down these bad guys, which we did. That's where it stops. We we were not allowed to talk about exactly what we did, right? You know, how we made books on these people, how we, you know, it, that 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 was the majority of the blackout stuff. Mm -hmm. So you you were allowed to begin a program, small, but begin a program that was what um, more kinetic. I'm not sure what the adjective to use here is, but a little bit more direct um, as a as a tool that we could wield in the war on terrorism, and you had you had top cover for a while, and then all of a sudden, it just seemed like some of the what they were called political considerations came into effect, and the blowback from it. Um, a lot of a lot of time and effort was put into this, right? Not just yours, but but several other high octane officers were pulled into this effort, and then suddenly you found that no, we we've decided not to go that direction, even, even after we had some senior level buy-in downtown, right? Well, you know, what's, what's amazing is that um, 
it actually is even worse than that because I, I was chief of ops when and Kofor was the, the still the director when I realized that we were kicking the crap out of the Taliban and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. But one thing that I learned from my past tours was that the, the soft underbelly of any terrorist organization or criminal organization is the support mechanisms. Those are the people you cannot afford to lose because they're the ones that bring the money, the medicines, the transportation, the recruitment. They are that known entity of somebody. They have to have a public life. So I went to Kofor and I briefed him and I told him, and as a matter of fact, Hank Crumpton was in, in the uh, in the room. I said, you, you know, boss, I said, you know, we're doing really well with, with Hank's program, but we got a lot of bad guys in all corners of the world outside of the war theaters that are walking around with impunity and they are the real Achilles heel. Of, uh, so I elaborated on that and he said, well, you're, you're the chief of ops, fix it. This, this was on a Friday. I spent the weekend, notepad, I was like a lawyer this time, of notepad after notepad after notepad of ideas. I went back in and briefed him on Monday and I, I gave him the concept of, 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 uh, of what I, I thought we needed to do. And he loved it. And he says, well, now you got to find me a senior officer to head this. And I go, I already got one. He goes, who? I said, me. <laughs> he kicked me out of his office. He literally told me in no uncertain terms, you're my cops. You ain't going anywhere. Go find me somebody. Mm -hmm. Who do you think I went to? Ben Bonk. Yeah. I talked to Ben. Uh, ben and I hit him up again in the afternoon. And like I said, Ben, ben could do anything with Kofor. And uh, I got the green light to, to, to do the team. And the, the concept of the team was to create a capability that we could identify three or more logistic figureheads, people that if, if, the, if we took them out, uh, it, there would be an impact. You know, if, if you catch a shooter, gets replaced by 10. You kill bin Laden, I, you know, Qaeda still is, is still there. So, you know, the, the leaders are harder to get. And there's a hydra effect that, you know, you cut one head off and one or two come, come, come back up. So the idea was start making, doing surveillance, unilateral surveillance on these individuals that we knew because the DI shops had given us all the ammo we needed to get it approved that these were people worth disrupting. As you know, that's one of our mottos, preempt and disrupt and preempt. Um, so the idea was, imagine if um, all of a sudden we had the same chatter that we had prior to 9-11. We know something's going on. We know Al-Qaeda has something to do with it. But can imagine if, let's use Hezbollah. And what do you think happens if all of a sudden we take out three of those individuals in their organization? One gets turned into the cops, one gets duct taped, the other one gets shot in the head. They're, they're disrupted. They have to hit the brakes. They feel that they're penetrated and may allow us to, uh, to dig, dig further because now they have chasms in their, their personnel, but you may be able to recruit more into or whatever. Um, you know, this, this, this uh, program was vilified and leaked to the press. And I'll never forget it because uh, when it first came out, uh, it was on a Thursday night and I was having cigars with Paco when Kofor, then Jose, then Rob Richard all called me. Reporters called asking for comment. Your name associated with CIA head squads is coming out in front page. Imagine going home to my wife on Thursday evening and saying, hey, babe, you need to sit down. Um, mm. So that, that but it was vilified. It was it was you know, this was a punitive uh, hit squad by by CIA. It was not. Right. It was a extremely well thought out because I didn't do it in a vacuum. I had the vision, but I had some really, really smart paramilitary and operational officers with me in that team. I mean, mm. you figure out of my five ops folks. One retired as an SIS-5, the other four SIS-4s. That tells you something. So I had pick of the litter. Yeah. I really had, you know, uh, real dogs in there. So um, it, it was completely misconstrued and, and it caused a lot of damage because it negated a capability yeah. that how can we afford not to have that in our toolbox? Mm -hmm. so. It feeds back to the story that, you know, many of us have reflected on, which is the, the what if about bin Laden. Right. There were there were opportunities when bin Laden, you know, even if you wait until after 
he issues his fatwa and declares that Americans everywhere are, are, are safe targets. Um, even if you wait till after the embassy bombings, um, and yet even after that, there were opportunities to, to take out bin Laden that either were not taken or were not effective because of some, uh, scaled back operations for political and, and other considerations. And it, and it's hard to say that in retrospect, that it would have been a bad idea to, to take out bin Laden when he was actively plotting already had American blood on his hands. Um, and yet the idea of a team designed to do that, if another such case were to come up, is is unacceptable. There, there wasn't really a full, honest, public discussion of that. Now, some of the aspects of it, that's the danger of our business. It needs to be kept secret in order to be effective. But I think society just immediately raced to the easy solution, which is, oh, that's too much like those movies. We don't want to do that. Well, you know, one, one of the biggest problems that our agency suffers is that we are seldom led by people from the inside at the highest levels. You know, uh, when you bring in somebody um, like George Tennant, who was a political appointee, who was a been a staffer, uh, and, 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 uh, and John Brennan, to a degree, was also an outsider because he was not an ops guy. You know, but nonetheless, he ended up uh, running the agency. Um, when you are politically tied to the belly button of a party or a special interest, you cannot run operations militarily or agency-wise through the optic of politics. It's counter, counterintuitive. Um, I, I have heard people say that one of the reasons, very well-sourced uh, comments, the, that the main reason that our programs died was because if we were successful, nobody would know about it and we would get the credit internally. But if it was unsuccessful, everybody would know about it and their heads were going to roll. That was some of the management we had at the time. So uh, obviously Kofor wasn't, if, if Kofor had been moved up as DDO as he should have been mm. from after uh, CTC, yeah. like Jose was, um, I think we'd be, we'd, be, we'd be having a very different conversation. Yeah. Well, Rick, we end our conversations on Chatter by reaching into the Chatterbox and finding a random question to ask. We've covered so much ground that often comes up in these questions that I fear this will be repetitive, but let's see. Oh, here's a good one. Who played the best James Bond? Bar none, uh, Sean Connery uh, from the beginning. And I think that uh, Daniel Craig has actually done a very good job. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Roger Moore had the panache, yeah. but unfortunately his movies were all spoofs. Right. Uh, you know, moon they, they, you know the one about the coming from the moon and, yeah. you know, Guy Jaws and all this kind of, it, it became cartoonish Yeah, uh, where the James Bond movies were, rough cut and in the, in the character that he played, if you, if you, I read all the novels when I was 13 years old, that, that might've had an mm. effect on me, but you know, the, the way that he was always described in, in, in the books was he was a diamond, a rough diamond in a velvet glove. He was a guy that could dress yeah. and, and talk and gamble and drive nice cars, but he was somebody that would ruin your day. And I think that Sean Connery carried that, um, even um, uh, Pierce uh, uh, Brosman, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who is an incredible actor, and I like him in a lot of things, I don't think that he ever carried off mm -hmm. that tough guy character. Right. He, he looks tougher now that he's aged a little bit. But I, I think at the time he was just too pretty to be, you know, uh, a, 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 you know stone killer intel guy for, for the MI6. And the James Bond character has come to be seen because of the, the success of the movie franchise as, as a hero. But as originally conceived in the novels, he was not really a pure hero. He had some he had some negative characteristics associated with his personality and background. Very much so. Very yeah. much so. Well, we'll all see who plays uh, Rick Prado in the successful movie version of a true life story, perhaps pulled from your book, Black Ops. Rick, thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you very much for having me, David. I really appreciate the opportunity. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.